All right, if you want to turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 14, I'm going to get there in just a second. But you guys know we're in this series called Made for More. We're made for more, and, and it is the will of God that we were all made for more. We're made to go all in. And, and one of these scriptures that's kind of become a theme for me in this series and for all of us is, is, is in John 14, uh, really fast, uh, verse 12. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. I love that so much because Jesus says that, that I'm not the ceiling, I'm the floor, that you're going to do even greater things than I have done. And we need to keep thinking that once we think we fully arrived, well, guess what? Jesus has some more. And once we've done that, well, guess what? Jesus has some more. So we were made for more, uh, dot, 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 not period. So pastor mentioned last week in his message that uh, we want to help you recognize that you're made for more, that we're all a vessel for God's kingdom. And every one of us plays a vital role in the body. And that's what I love so much that the hand can't say to the foot that one's more important than the other, that all of us here today, if you're under the sound of this voice, you play a role in God's house. And I think when we understand and do more, then the entire church gets to do more. And when the entire church gets to do more, the kingdom gets to do more. And when the kingdom gets to do more, people get saved. And when people get saved, heaven increases. And guess what happened? When heaven increases, hell decreases. So you are directly tied to heaven coming here on earth. And it's time that we recognize that God has called us and, and named us that we were made for more. Made for more than just consuming. We were made to give our life away. We were made to pour our life out. And all God will ever ask of you is to do your best because that's what he did for us. So let's look at this beautiful story in Mark chapter 14. I love it. Uh, it's going to really paint a beautiful, sweet picture uh, of a sacrifice, an extravagant giving, an extravagant uh, form of worship and generosity to our King of kings and our Lord of lords. Let, let's look at uh, 14 verse 1. Jesus anointed at Bethany. Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming, underline that word, scheming. I'm going to stop right there real quick. How many of y'all know while they were scheming to kill Jesus, someone else was scheming to do something else? Yeah. Amen. They were scheming to kill Jesus. Verse 2, but not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. Verse 3, while he was in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, I'm going to pause right there again. Simon, by the way, who had leprosy previously, you guys know back in the day, if you had a skin disease, people wouldn't be around you. But obviously at this point in time, he was healed, which is why he wanted to have a party for Jesus to show his gratitude and thanksgiving. And isn't it amazing that when God moves in our, our life, our first response is to open our life back up to him and show him thankfulness for all that he's done for us. So that's what Simon was doing here. He was hosting a party. And it says, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume. This wasn't 1996 Tommy Hilfiger. It wasn't something that you buy in Walmart off the clearance rack. This was the very expensive perfume from the Himalayan mountains made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Now watch this. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, meaning angry and with annoyance, indignantly to one another. Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages in the money given to the poor. And it says that they rebuked her harshly. Isn't it funny when you want to do something extravagant for God, it attracts critics? critics? So Jesus says, this isn't your party. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, leave me alone. <laughs> leave her alone, says Jesus. The poor you will always have, and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Now turn to your neighbor one more time and tell him the title of this message. Say, I'm going for broke. I'm going for broke. And I'm going to clear that up in just a second so you guys know what I'm talking about. I don't know what your attitude towards risk and reward is, but I, 
anytime I want to make sure that the reward is worth the risk. And we see a woman here who's willing to take a risk, to make a move, to break a barrier, to do something so significant that we're still talking about it till this day. And it's a dark time in the life of Jesus. Waiting for him in Jerusalem is a religious lynch mob. And he's going to be assaulted by their accusations, which aren't substantiated, but nevertheless acted upon. And he knows this because, well, he's, he's Jesus, right? And in verse 3, it says, while, I love this, and, uh, while he was in Bethany, it says, reclining at the table. Isn't that cool? They're scheming to kill him and destroy him, and he's just sitting back chilling. He's like, I, God's got this. I'm good. He's eating dessert, drinking a Starbucks, and he's chilling. I love that. Wish I could be that way under pressure. But he's got to get some sleep since it's Holy Week and he's going to pay the price for our sins. And yet he stops by Bethany at this party where this really good cook named Martha lived and her sister Mary. And understand this, that one of the reasons that everyone at the table thought what she did was wasteful was because they did not share her personal experience with Jesus. One of the ways you can tell about someone's personal experience with Jesus is by what they define as extravagant. A lot of people think you're crazy just to go to church on Saturday and Sunday. You mean to tell me that you have a couple hours every week where you don't have to work and you can do whatever you want and you're going to go to church? You're going you're gonna to sing a few songs? You're going to listen to some guy talk? I mean, that's pretty extravagant, right? And to, and to think that some of you would put on a parking vest or go serve in our kids or go serve in the lobby, you would actually show up an hour early to serve and then attend church? I mean, that's pretty extravagant, right? And that's what I love so much about our dream team and the people that serve this house is because we understand that we were made for more. And, and just a quick little story, I could talk about hundreds, I don't have enough time, but one person that really blessed my soul a few months ago is one of our leaders on the coffee team, and, and uh, it just really struck, to, struck me to my core when I observed that he's here at 7 a.m. every single weekend. He's the first one here. He beats our facilities team here, and he's normally the first one here at the building. He's waiting. He's prayed up. He's fired up. He runs in the door. He brews the coffee. He runs the coffee. He cleans the coffee. He leads the team, and he does all this while having five-star customer service, and he serves from 11, or 7 a.m. to about 11.20 so that he can slip in here and go to service, but what's so crazy is he's sweating, he's dripping, he's working hard, he's working hard, and I just see him in the lobby. I'm like, dude, what are you doing, man? You're killing yourself. Like, this is crazy. I'm like, I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm like, why do you do this? And he looks at me, and he, he like, wipes the sweat off his face, and he, and he says, Evan, if you know what Jesus brought me through, this is the least I can do for him. This is the least I can do for him. And it blew me away because he came to the conclusion that it's a privilege to serve in God's house. It's a privilege to pour your life out for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so I was interested by how Mary came in and interrupted the dinner. She was risking a lot here. Back in those days, a woman couldn't just barge in on a meeting of men, especially the disciples and other men of influence. So she barges in there, and it wasn't customary, but something caused her to interrupt the dinner. So it says that Mary had this alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, like the one right here. And the alabaster jar represented her entire life, represented her earnings, her business, Represented her time, her talent, her treasure, her identity, her blood, her sweat, her tears, her family, her future. It represented everything that she was and had. And again, you can kind of picture the scene with me. She walks in and, and everyone kind of turns and looks at the door kind of like, what, what do you need? What do you want? And keep in mind, Mary played no significant purpose in the house. She wasn't the host and she wasn't the cook. So nobody cared about Mary. So she comes in the room and she's got this jar and people are just, just kind of staring at her like, like what's going on? And, and so she, she, she grabs the jar, her very expensive perfume, and she, she goes up to Jesus and, and, and she, she just begins to pour it out just a little bit. And at this point, the disciples are looking at her, and, they're, and, and this is what they said. They, they criticized her. They, they, it says they rebuked her harshly. And keep in mind, this is Jesus' disciples, not the Pharisees or the Sadducees or people who were opposing Jesus. These are 
These are his closest people, and they're kind of like, Mary, what are you doing? Like, if you want to show Jesus you love him, why don't you just, just pour a little bit out? Just, 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 just a little bit will do. And if you really want to do something, what you would do is you would go sell your perfume, and you'd bring the money back, and then we could give it to the poor. We could go on missions trips. We could, you could fund this ministry. Like, what are you doing? You're, you're acting pretty ridiculous here. Like, we got business to do. Like, do your thing and, and get out of here. But, but I love so much how Mary just doesn't even listen to them, and she, she, just, she just continues to pour it out. She just pours a little bit more out. And then you can still picture it here. She's pressing further and further, and the disciples are like, okay, Mary, we get it. You love Jesus. That's awesome. I mean, let's, let's be reasonable here, Mary. Let's do something great for God. What you're doing is ridiculous. What you're doing is illogical and irrational, and uh, I think we could put your little alabaster jar of perfume to some better use. But, and I want to let you guys know that all of us here today has an alabaster jar. You know that, right? We all have our life that's meant to be poured out, and we get to decide how much to pour out to Jesus based on what he's done in our life. We all get to pour it out based on what he's done in our life. And I think sometimes we play games with God. We say, you know, like, like, like Onyx, who I mentioned earlier, but other people that know that God has brought them through significant trials and tribulations and, 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 and maybe God has healed your marriage or, or, you know, done amazing things in your life. And, and, and we just, we just want to tip God. We just want to, we just want to give him a drop and we just want to keep the perfume, keep it to ourselves. And, and by this time, after several drops, the whole room is filled with aroma, but we, we look at things in our life and we say, well, how, how much is enough? We say, is that enough? Jesus healed my marriage. Is this enough? Jesus gave me children I didn't think I could ever have. Is this enough? Jesus blessed my business. I have multiple locations now. Is this enough? Jesus paid the price for my sins on Calvary and no longer have to bridge my own gap to heaven. Is this enough? And we all have to ask ourselves how much is enough. But I love Mary's persistence, and she came in there with a purpose, which I'll get to in a minute. But she did the illogical. She did the irrational. She did the ridiculous. She did the strategic. She did this stupid thing, despite what the disciples said and their uh, ill-warranted uh, advice for her. But I love how Mary had a sense that she would never get this opportunity again. I know she had a sense. The Bible doesn't tell us directly. But very shortly after this, Jesus was headed to the cross. And she said, she said, despite what they have to say, she came in there with a purpose and a sense of knowing that here I stand in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and I'm never going to get this opportunity again. Mary said, I'm going for broke. She said, I'm all in. She said, I'm sold out. She said, I'm made for more. And she said that my king is going to do amazing things when I pour it out in front of him in his presence. And she did not consider it to be a waste. Mary said, this is worship. She said, my giving is worship. My giving is not a waste. And Jesus said, leave her alone. She has done a beautiful thing to me. Giving is an act of worship. Mary went for broke. She didn't go for financial poverty. She went for broke, meaning the moment in time where she broke the alabaster box that represented everything she was, and she invited Jesus into everything in her life. She went all in. She gave it all to Jesus, and catch this. And shortly after she broke it all for Jesus, Jesus gave it all for her. Mary had the revelation that she was made for more. Mary had the revelation of giving and extravagant generosity. She knew her gift would last for eternity. I love this so much. Jesus adores her generosity. Again, he said, she has done a beautiful thing to me. Our giving is worship. We need to understand our outlook. Sometimes we're jaded and confused. We come in here and we think that Seven Hills needs something from me or God needs something from me, but you should reverse your thinking and you actually need the revelation of giving. You need the blessing of God on your life. You need to understand that like Mary, your life was meant to be poured out. 
Verse 9, Jesus tells us that Mary's gift had eternal impacts. When I was reading this story, it hit me at the last second. This is just so amazing. Jesus said, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told. Check this out. Jesus took Mary's extravagant giving to the cross. Her extravagant giving made its way to the cross on Calvary. Jesus said she poured her perfume on my body to prepare me for my burial, to prepare me for what I'm about to do. Isn't it remarkable that her giving was connected to the miracle of salvation that all of us get to experience today? Isn't that an amazing thing to think about? Mary understood investing in eternity. Mary understood extravagant generosity. She understood living a legacy-focused life. Mary understood that she was made for more. She wasn't made to just be practical and let's get real, Mary, and I understand what you're doing. She came in there with a purpose. She didn't listen to them. She broke it all, and she gave it all to Jesus. So here we are in 2019 still talking about Mary's gift. Jesus said your treasure would determine two things. We heard the scripture earlier that your treasure would determine the course of your life and the condition of your heart. Let me say it again. Your treasure would determine the course of your life and the condition of your heart. Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You will never experience the fullness of God if you don't understand the revelation of giving. And I'm talking about time, talent, and treasure. When you pour your life out, that's when you experience the fullness of of God. If you don't understand giving, you don't understand God. For God so loved the world that he first gave. That's the first thing he did for you and I. He never took. He always gave. And Jesus cares about our attitude towards money and honoring him. And we don't give because of guilt and shame. Romans 8, uh, chapter 8, verse 1, relieves us of all of that here today. Uh, therefore, there's no co condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So set yourself free from that. I'm talking about we give out of a response of what God has already done in our life. Just like Onyx and many of you here today, it's because God's brought me through. He saw me through. He's gave me victory. And how could I not respond with honor and gratitude? Tithing is the first step in honoring God and returning back what's already his. God is a God of order. He wants to be number one in our life. Matthew 6, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all these things shall be added unto you. I love the word added. That means that something's going to be there that wasn't there previously. And he wants to be first, not second, not third, not when it's convenient, when you feel good, when you have the resources, when your situation and circumstance warrants itself. He said, I want to be number one in your life. <laughs> Tithing builds our relationship with God. You don't generously return back to him what's already his. If I borrowed Pastor Matt's phone to make a phone call, I'm not going to go back to him and say, hey, I'm going to generously give you your phone back. He's going to say, Evan, th this is my phone. I, I, I let you borrow it. I appreciate it, but this is my phone, right? We honor God with our finances. I believe the Lord gave me this sentence when I was doing this research, but the body of Christ doesn't have a resource issue. It has an honor issue. How can the blood of Jesus move through the body of Christ with a bunch of clogged arteries, you know, each and every one of us is an artery. We, our artery, we all play a role in, in God's house, and I'm not here to make anyone feel bad. I'm here to let you know that the body of Christ is counting on you. It's counting on you. You play a role. How can the blood of Jesus reach the people who need it when the vessels are clogged? It's his. He's the owner. We're the steward. And the quicker God's people can realize that, the quicker we can get more people to heaven. David said, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all, his, all the people belong to him. Psalms 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Not 80%, 90%, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. It all belongs to him. We return back to what's his. It's so that he can sow it into the kingdom to reach more people. We have to start thinking kingdom business and not coming to church like it's a, a charter club. Imagine what God could do. Did you know that if everyone just did their part, I'm not even talking about uh, people with the gift of giving that go over, above, and beyond, heart for the house. I'm not even, that's over here. That's generosity. I'm talking about people just did what God asked you to do. If you would just simply honor him and invite him into your life, the, the impact that we could make, it's exponential. When the whole body is operating at full capacity, instead of uh, 
you know, not 50, 60 percent. What we could do is pretty amazing when we honor God with the tithe. And God says, I will bless you exceedingly abundantly more. Let me break that down for you. Exceedingly means far surpassing. So that means I've set a goal here and God says, that's nothing. You're dreaming too small. I'm going to take you over there. And then abundantly means overflowing. That means I'm the cup that doesn't run dry. So you will always have resources and it's far above, exceedingly above, overflowing in your life is what God promises us. I'm not talking about a slot machine, God, where it's instantly. I'm talking about over time, God says, I'll bless you exceedingly and abundantly more than you can ever think, hope, or imagine. And I love how God introduces this idea of blessing early on in the Bible. In the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, God tells Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great. That means, he says, Abraham, I'm going to give you resources and I'm going to give you influence and you will be a blessing. So he says, listen up here, man. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to do some great things, but I'm only going to do this so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless, the, bless you, curse those who curse you, and all the people of the earth will be blessed through you. we got to understand that God wants to work in and through our lives. We're a vessel for his kingdom. We were made for more. And like Mary, we have to decide in our heart to go for the moment where we go for broke and we don't go back because we want God to use us for his kingdom. We're called to be rivers and not reservoirs. God wants to work in and through our lives, and we're not a bunch of stagnant pools of dead waste. We're vibrant, healthy, flourishing rivers, and that's when God can really use us to do something great. And here's the thing. I've never met a generous person who regretted it. Just stay with me for a minute. I've never met someone who said, I've lived my life, I honor God, I go above and beyond, I look for ways to be generous, I bless people at work and my family anonymously, I do many things because I want to overflow, because I'm connected to the source. I've never met a generous person who said, I wish I didn't do it. I wish I wasn't generous. I wish I didn't honor God with what he's just asking me to do. I wish I didn't do it. I've never met that person. The person doesn't exist because God changes your heart when you start to open up to him. But I have met people who wish they started tithing and being generous earlier in their life. I have met people that said, I'm 50 years old and I wish I started tithing when I was 20. I wish I would have involved God from the beginning. Because let me help someone out today. When you start with God, you'll always end with God. But if you start with worry, you'll always end in worry. If you start with insufficiency, you'll end in insufficiency. If you start with God, you'll always end with God. Many people in this room right now have taken the tithe and faith challenge and they've come back and said, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm so thankful that you challenged me in this area. And the idea of today is not to make you feel bad. That's that's not what I want to do. I want to open up your eyes because I'll share here in a little bit. This was not something easy for me. And we're talking about the grace of giving. It's a process. It's a discipleship issue that we're talking about uh, here right now. And I want to look back in verse 3. I'm closing with this. Uh, this beautiful little detail that we can so easily miss. I love this so much. It says, before she poured the perfume, she broke the jar. I think that's a great little detail. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Meaning, she, she broke the neck of the thing that held and contained her identity, her purpose, her whole entire life. She broke it. Meaning that she burned the ship. She burned the bridge. She said, I'm not going back. I'm all in. I'm selling out. What do you want me to do now? She understood the revelation that she was made for more and she went for broke. That's such a great little detail that Mary went in there with a purpose. She went in there with such tenacity and intensity and she knew her purpose. And so we stand here today and I wonder when the last time in your relationship with God that you went for broke. And again, don't misread what I'm saying. I'm not talking about financial poverty. I'm not talking about leaving here and selling everything you have. I'm talking about the moment in time when in your heart you say, God, I'm going to invite you to every area of my life. I'm tired, of do- I'm tired of doing it on my own because if I start with doing it on my own, I'm going to end with doing it on my own. When's the moment, the last time in your life when you went for broke? And most of us don't consult our faith when we gauge what we want to do for God. We consult our convenience, our resources, our current situation. But can I help someone out today? Did you know that facts and feelings are really poor substitutes for faith? 
I think there's three things really fast that happen when we talk about giving that are biblical. Number one, people get offended because people don't like looking at the condition of their heart because people have to actually challenge their values and their priorities in their life and often causes people to get offended. Second thing is people give out obligation. Okay, I have to God, I'll give you a little drip drop here. We play games with God. I know the Bible tells me to, so I guess I'll do it. But I love Mary's spirit. I think there's something we can learn from Mary. Mary people say that giving is not offensive. Giving is not an obligation. Giving is, matter of fact, the greatest opportunity we've ever been given on the planet. To say that God wants to use me for his kingdom to reach other people, that is the single greatest opportunity and purpose we could ever have on the entire planet. And that's how I've come to look at giving. And like I mentioned, it wasn't always like that for me. Rachel and I, I remember when we started today, she said tithing's really important to me and my family. I've been doing it since I was little. If you're not down with this, then we're not gonna work out. And I remember I was like, okay, well, you know, a couple dollars here, a couple dollars there, or whatever, start to work my way in, work my way in. I remember I graduated and got my first big boy job and, you know, actually had a decent, you know, paycheck. I wasn't like completely broken. I remember writing that first check and I would round to the penny and I said, God, you're not getting any more than this. I wouldn't round up, I would round down to that exact penny. And I just remember one day, you know, it took years and years, and finally we way surpassed that now because it just felt like the Lord is working, and he's, of course, he's worthy of it. But I remember one day the Lord just said, you know what, Evan, you can play games all you want. You can drip drop here and there. You can give me a tip here and there. But you know what? If you start with me, then you'll always have me, and you'll always end with me because I'm the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I'm the cup that doesn't run dry. I'm the north and the south and the east and the west. I'm the beginning, and I'm the end. I am the first and I am the last. And Jesus said, if you want to play games with me, that's okay. But I want to do something great in your life. You were made for more and I have a great purpose for you. And if you want to do something great for me, you're going to have to go for broke. Just like Mary did in the presence of our king. And look at this. Isn't it amazing when Mary went broke for Jesus that he did the same for her? Jesus didn't withhold his life. He didn't spare his life. He didn't call the angel armies to come down and save him and rescue him. Yeah, he had a moment where he said, God, if it be your will. But then he said, it is your will, and I'm going to do it. And Thomas tried to talk Jesus out of it. Thomas said, Jesus, why are you going to Jerusalem? They're going to kill you. And he said, you know what, Jesus? Or you know what, Thomas? I'm going for broke. I'm going for broke because I'm going all in, because I was made for more by my Father in heaven, and I've got an assignment to do, I've got people to save, and I've got an assignment and a purpose, I was made for more, I'm going all in, and Jesus did not withhold nothing from you, so we should not withhold anything from him, because he's worthy. And when you think about what God's done in your life, it is impossible not to honor him and want to do exceedingly abundantly more. I get fired up when talking about generosity, man. He's worthy. We keep trying to give him a couple drops and he's trying to give you the, the cup that doesn't run dry and we, we have our little eight ounces and we want to spare it, but he's trying to give us something way more. Rachel and I tithe and honor God because, we're, because we want to, but we're not just returning resources. When we honor God in our giving, we're breaking a jar. There's some things in our lives that we break when we honor God. Number one, we break the grip of greed on our life. We break the idea that stuff and materialism own me. I'm not a slave to it, it doesn't own me, and we break the grip of greed in our lives. Number two, we break the cycle of scarcity. We break the cycle of worry. We break the cycle of it's never enough. Because he is our source and God says he will not withhold any good thing from us. I'm breaking the cycle of never enough. I'm breaking the cycle of worry. I'm starting with my source and not my situation. And number three, we break barriers. Again, Jesus says, greater things you shall do. He wants to take us higher, take us further. And we look at Vision Week and everything we're doing. This is not the end. This is the beginning. This is the floor and not the ceiling. We break barriers when we honor God with our giving. <laughs> 